because I, um, I know this is supposed to be an intimate event, but because I wrote After Image so long ago, I actually can't remember it very well. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided <laughs> to write something down to read to you because uh, otherwise I would just say it's a book about photography in 18 something, blah, blah, blah. So I wrote down a little, a uh, little speech of sorts just to read, to, to introduce the book to you and say a few things about the writing of it. And then um, I thought I'll read a couple of passages. It was funny looking at the book after, s I haven't looked at it since I published it, and um, I thought, oh, it's not so bad. I was <laughs> looking at it this morning, <laughs> couldn't even really remember any of it, and I thought, oh, it's not so bad. So it was kind of pleasant to discover that. Um, uh, this book began with the photographs of Julie Margaret Cameron, and I, I brought a book of Julie Margaret Cameron's book, which you probably can't really see, but this is a photograph on the front of um, uh, oh God, Julia Duckworth, who was Virginia Woolf's mother, who was the niece of Julie Margaret Cameron. And I went to a show of photographs um, at the AGO, Cameron's photographs, and there were many photographs of um, her maid, Mary Hillier, dressed as the Virgin Mary. And I walked around the exhibition and I thought, oh, how odd that is to be the maid and yet be dressed as the Virgin Mary. And it also s said, there were these notes that said that she was required to be in her costume uh, uh, as the Virgin Mary all the time. So she was the <laughs> maid dressed as the Virgin Mary, dusting the house and doing all these things, but she was still the maid. So I, it was, um, I'll show you one of the photos of that. I don't know if you can see it very well. So what I wanted to do in the beginning was to, let's see. She's the Virgin Mary. <laughs> what I wanted in the beginning was to write about that relationship between the maid and the mistress, as it were. But when I tried to research Mary Hillier, of course, the world being as it is, history only really belonging to the rich people, um, there was nothing about her. Just a few things to say she had married and how many children she had had. Uh, so. I had to, you know, largely invent her, and I decided to go instead to Cameron, where there was a, who, where there was a lot more information, and deal with the relationship. Sort of, even though the maid was going to be the main character, the information about the relationship is going to have to come through Cameron's side of things. So what I decided to do was the, the thing. I, with, I've written a number of books that have been based in the past, and the, and the thing about writing about the past is that. It's impossible to get it right. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's impossible to even get it partially right. But <laughs> you try to do something to make it believable at least. And what I do try and do is to, in every book that I write, is to just pick something that I'm faithful to and really try and be faithful to that one aspect as much as I can. So in After Image, what I, what I did was I used the photographs that Cameron took of her maid as the basis for the book. Each chapter of the book is named after a photograph that she took. and so. I used the real photographs, the real gestures in the photographs, and um, that's the thing that I tried to be faithful to, the taking of those photographs and also the process that she used to develop the, the photographs after taking them. Um, so what else I need to say about this? Uh, that, that is real. Everything else is made up. Everything else is my fiction, but the photographs themselves are real and her process is real. And I was lucky enough when I was researching the book to find a man in Ottawa who still took photographs with a box camera using glass plate negatives in the old style. He actually had a parrot and everything as well. He was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to, you know, look through the camera and talk to him and look at all those. Uh, it was very, that was very helpful. So I spent a long time, you know, researching the process. Um, I'm just going to read you two scenes now, I think, from the book. Um, where she's taking a photograph for Cameron. The character in my book, who is sort of based on Cameron, is called Isabel Daschle. Uh, and the maid, who is based on Mary Hillier, is um, called Annie Fallon. Who's, she's an um, Irish maid, come to work in England at a time when the Irish were, because of the famine, were leaving England, leaving Ireland and coming to England in droves and being treated, most part, very badly and, and being used as cheap, cheap labor. Um, one other thing I want to say about the real, the real Mary Hillier, I think, had, uh, I think their relationship was, 
a decent relationship. In her own life, she went on and married, which was an unusual thing for a maid to do, and she was lucky to be able to be allowed to marry. And she had, I think, eight children, and one of whom she named after Julie Margaret Cameron. So that tells me that, you know, that it was a, their relationship was a fairly decent one, even though she had to be dressed as the Virgin Mary and was actually, th you know, when she went to village, the village to collect things, the children ran after her and pelted her with apples and things. And <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it wasn't that easy. Uh, okay, this story takes place in 1865 in England at the Dashiell household. Uh, there's three characters really in the story. There's Annie Phelan, there's Isabel Dashiell, and her husband, Eldon Dashiell, who, who's a, he's a map maker, and Isabel is a photographer, and she's uh, at the beginning of something, photography, and the beginning really of our image culture, the culture that we live in now. And he, as a map maker, is at the end of something. This idea of making maps as sort of artistic documents, rather, they, what they became were, was, were documents for exploitation, for plunder. Um, so in that marriage, those two things are going on. One, one of them is moving into the modern world, and one of them is trying to hang on to the old world. And so there's tensions there. And then into that marriage comes Annie Phelan, who they both try to um, control for different reasons. And everything gets all mixed up. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to read you a couple of scenes. Never mind what I told you, says Cook, when Annie appears back in the kitchen. I need you to take these to the lady. She's in the glass house, down the garden. Cook thrusts two goose wings at Annie. The feathered wings are fully extended and very stiff. They have crude leather hoops sewn onto the underside of them, two on each wing. On the path in the garden that leads to the glass house, Annie meets Eldon Dashiell. He is tall and thin with a straggly reddish beard and glasses. Hurrying towards the house, looking down at the patterns of stones and grass between his feet, he doesn't see Annie until he is almost upon her. Excuse me. He looks up, delicately sidesteps, sees her armload of wings and then her face. Angels, he says, you must be the new maid. Annie Phelan, sir, says Annie, bowing her head. She has said her name so often this day that it is finally starting to feel as though it does belong to her. Well, I'm pleased to meet you, Annie Phelan. Eldon bows his head and smiles. But don't let me hold you up. The genius doesn't like to be kept waiting. He nods his head again. Good day and then he continues walking the path to the house. Annie stands outside the hen house. Through the glass, she can see the murky shape of Isabel floating around like a dark underwater bird. Over the gray stone wall, the apple trees make a puzzle of the sky. When Annie enters the glass house, she sees a large wooden box on stick legs at the far end. Isabel is in front of the box, bending over a small child lying on a bench. The bench is covered in black cloth, and black cloth is also hung from the ceiling to create a curtain against the end wall. Another child stands listlessly off to one side of the box. He is naked. The child lying on the bench has a white sheet draped over him. Ma'am, says Annie, but no one hears her. She advances into the room. Sunlight makes bright flowers on the stone floor. She can hear muffled bird song from outside. Ma'am, she says again, and this time Isabel turns around. Thank God, she says, with such relief in her voice that Annie looks behind her to make sure that there isn't someone else in the room whom Isabel is addressing. Isabel takes the goose wings from Annie and gives them to the standing naked boy. Now, Tobias, put these on quickly, please. The boy looks at the wings scornfully and slowly starts to thread an arm through the leather straps. They're on loan, says Isabel to Annie. My cousin's children, silly little buggers, she says under her breath, just loud enough for Annie to hear. There, she looks at Annie in triumph. I've made you smile. I didn't think you knew how. Oh, Tobias, pick it up. The standing naked child has dropped one of the wings and is fumbling around trying to grab hold of it with his feathery arm. Isabel goes to help him. Annie watches them. The lady doesn't seem so fearsome here. Her movements are tamer. The light flooding through the glass roof softens the whole scene. Annie feels almost as if she could cup her hands around it and contain it safely there, the gentle push of its heart against her fingers. Beat. It doesn't beat. It drops. It falls to earth slowly like a word after it's been said. Now Tobias, come and lean over Alfred and look mournful. Isabel moves behind the box on sticks and looks through a hole in it. The standing naked boy obediently moves closer to his brother and slumps over Alfred. You don't need to smother him, says Isabel. Tobias looks at her with contempt in his eyes. I am the angel of death, he says. But Alfred is already dead, says Isabel. You don't need to kill him again. You were only supposed to guide him out of his mortal self. His what, says Tobias. Alfred's arm suddenly drops over the side of the bench and hits the floor. Oh, wake him up. Isabel steps back from the box and rubs her forehead. Infidels, she says to Annie. Disaster. Annie notices again the blackness of Isabel's hands. Silver nitrate, says Isabel. It dyes them black, permanently. She waves them under Annie's nose. Blacker than yours after cleaning the grates, aren't they? 
Annie feels she is being challenged somehow, and there is something cruel in Isabel's voice. She looks away, looks at the scene coming undone on the bench. Ma'am, why do you have an angel, and yet you don't have prayers? Ah, Isabel glances briefly over at Tobias and Alfred, who are wrestling. Stop that, she says to them. Symbolism, she says to Annie. Religious symbols stand for moral values. The symbols are still useful, even if the religion is not. Annie shakes her head. You don't understand. No, ma'am. Come here. Isabel leads Annie over to the box. Look. She slides the cover from the small hole in the wood and makes Annie look through it. See, the angel of death is helping the dead boy out of this life. He is a passage between this world and the idea of another world. He is a sense of possibility, a looking up, a wonderment. An angel does not just belong to God. It's a feeling in us, a striving. Isabel's voice is airy, lifts with her excitement at what she is saying. When I have made this photograph, I want it to be that feeling of looking up. When I show it to people, that's what I want them to feel, the possibilities that could exist beyond this life. She pauses, puts her hand lightly on Annie's shoulder. Do you see, she says. OK, I think I'll stop there and just read you another um, scene where she takes another picture. Uh, the book is, is <coughs> full of her taking pictures, and in the in the taking of the pictures, the relationship between Isabel and Annie moves from one thing to another, and it moves from one of them having the power, Isabel, to, in the end, Annie having the power. Um, so I'm just going to read you one more short scene where she's taking another picture. Annie is outside cleaning her dusters. She taps them against the wall of the house, and the dust rises like smoke from the feathers. It is a warm day. She stands with her back against the wall of the house, feeling the heat weeping onto her skin from the stones. There is great activity in the glass house. Even from this distance, Annie can see the fluttering of dark figures in the building. She cannot help herself. She walks over to the hen house and gently slips in through the door. Wilkes, the gardener, is standing at the far end of the studio. He is dressed in what looks like a tablecloth, pinned at his throat so it becomes a cape. On his head is a rough sort of crown fashioned from painted cardboard. On his legs, breeches. On his feet, boots. Tess, the maid, is lying on her stomach on the floor in front of him, clutching onto his ankle. Her hair is loose and washes out from her head like seaweed, matted and wild. She is wrapped in a sheet. You're not trying to trip him up, says Isabel, circling them madly. You're begging him for forgiveness, begging him to take you back. I don't need to be forgiven, says Tess. Her voice sounds a bit muffled because she's lying on her face. Don't, says Wilkes irritably. What, says Isabel. She's cutting off my circulation. Wilkes shakes his leg as though Tess is a pesky dog he's trying to dislodge. He's the one what should be asking for forgiveness, says Tess. You're not Tess, says Isabel slowly. This is not now. You have to leave yourself behind. Even Annie, with her limited acquaintance of her fellow maid, knows that Tess could only ever be Tess. She would have great trouble leaving herself behind. Wilkes flaps his tablecloth cape impatiently. Who are they meant to be, ma'am? Annie asks, stepping forward into the room. Isabel looks at Annie for a moment before answering. Guinevere, she says, pointing to Tess. King Arthur, she taps Wilkes on the shoulder. Do you know the story? Annie shakes her head. She has read mostly novels, is not so familiar with the old tales. Guinevere and Arthur are married, says Isabel quickly. Guinevere has fallen in love with Lancelot, one of her husband's knights. They are discovered. Lancelot is banished. Guinevere is forced to beg forgiveness from her husband. And is she truly sorry, ma'am? No. Isabel thinks of Robert Hill, thinks that it is herself on the floor, grabbing onto his ankle, begging to be accepted into the society of the gentleman painters. No, she is more sorry that she was found out and that her husband banished her love. Annie feels banished, cast out from the life she has known, washed up on the unfamiliar shores of this world. Let me try, she says. They stare at each other across the sun-streaked room. Isabel is surprised at Annie's request. Certainly anyone, or indeed anything, will be better than the idiot laundry maid. All right, she says. Thank the Lord, says Tess. She struggles to her feet, ripping the sheet from her body in a gesture of glorious relief. May I be excused now, ma'am? Yes, yes. Isabel rescues the sheet and winds it around Annie. Tess leaves without a backwards glance. Wilkes watches her go. Isabel reaches up and removes the pins from Annie's hair. She loosens the hair from its tight nest with the same impatient, careless gesture that Annie had used to ruffle the feather dusters against the house wall. She lets one hand linger on her maid's head for an instant. Are you sure, she says, do you understand? Yes, I think so. But the moment she says this, Annie thinks, what do I understand? She has been swayed by the story, by words like banished and forgiveness. 
She hasn't had a book to read lately, and that feeling of story rushes through her like a swoon. Wilk stands up straight, flicks his tablecloth so it hangs properly from his shoulders. Annie arranges herself at his feet. The stone floor is cold and hard. When she reaches out for Wilkes's ankle, it is a relief to find it warm, to feel the heat of him through his boots. All right, Wilkes, says Isabel, moving back beside her camera. Look down at Guinevere, a little scorn, a little pity. She says as though she's reciting a cake recipe. Some anger, some hurt, a little love. And Annie, you hate him, but you need him to let you in. I mean, take you back. You need him to forgive you. Forgive me my trespasses. Annie is lonely for Jesus. She wants him back, wants him here. She reaches out with everything inside her and holds on to him for that moment before he will notice and pull away. Then Annie remembers Isabel, raises her head from her fl the floor and turns it so she can see the lady over her shoulder, all the while holding tightly to Jesus' ankle. Is this what you want from me? Isabel has never seen a gaze so sublimely sorrowful as Annie Phelan's. It is perfect, that searching sadness just right, and so too that she should be looking backwards. Of course, what matters is what's gone, not what is there. Guinevere is looking back at her love for Lancelot, not up in humility at her husband. She has not forgotten the true nature of her heart. She looks back fully, of what, fully aware of what it is she had and what it is she has lost. She looks back out of love, out of witness, out of remembrance. She looks back out of faith. Isabel can't take her eyes off Annie for fear that look will drain out of her. Don't move, she says, and rushes quickly to the table with the prepared glass plate and the bottle of collodion. Don't move, she mutters to herself <coughs> over and over again as she pours the collodion onto the plate and tilts the excess back into the bottle as she waits a moment for the plate to become sticky and then plunges it into the silver nitrate bath. Annie has not moved. Her gaze is as direct and mournful as when Isabel left her to attend to the plate. Isabel inserts the wooden holder into the camera. Don't move, she says one final time, and lifts the cover off the lens. Annie's neck hurts, and her eyes are starting to ache from staring so intently at Isabel. Let me in, thinks Isabel, for Annie, for herself, and the Robert Hills of the, wor wor of the world. Oh, Lord, thinks Annie, don't leave me. I cannot bear for you to go. The light carves them out of air, the folds of King Arthur's cape, the darkness of his hair. Light cuts around them, holds them as silhouettes, the long shape of Annie on the stone floor of the studio, pitched forward, looking back. And I'll stop reading that. Thanks. So good. <laughs> so, thanks. thanks.